Welcome back to part two of our series where I am going through and basically showing you how I manage my YouTube channel using Python. And so last video was probably like a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. And so in that one, it really was just trying to give us some context as to, you know, what does this need to look like? What are some things that I encounter when it comes to managing my content? And what are some of the different platforms that I use and everything like that? And so now that we kind of have a general idea of the context, we're going to make our next move over into our first API that we're going to be using in order to demonstrate how to you know, manage a channel potentially. Now, naturally, because it is YouTube, YouTube is going to be very important when it comes to automating a lot of what we do. Lucky for us, YouTube does offer an API. So Google, who owns YouTube, they have multiple APIs that allow you to do a wide range of tasks on your particular channel. So very useful. Um, this does not mean it's going to be perfect in every way and that every little thing that you can do on your channel is going to be uh, reproducible using the API. There are certain things that you cannot do yet um, on the API that you can do manually inside of your channel. So like in YouTube studio, uh, some of those things include adding, what was it? I think end cards, if I remember correctly. And <clears throat> it's a couple other things too. And there was some other recent stuff that I think by default, I have to kind of check um, things like monetization. Um, I don't know if they necessarily change the way you put the default setting on there. It used for me, at least it used to be go on by default. Now all of a sudden I have to start manually uh, entering it. It could just be a setting that I've turned off, but regardless, big thing that you want to take away from it is that there are going to be certain things that, you know, you're going to be able to do it in YouTube studio. Unfortunately, there's not really a API equivalent of doing that. And more than likely it's because YouTube's doing that on purpose. They don't want you to necessarily uh, have every capability through the API. Um, sometimes it can cause actually issues. So what we're going to be focusing and basically in this particular video is getting you set up with the project inside of Google Council. And then we are going to start the process of building a client. So the client will interact with the YouTube API. Now, technically you don't need to use this. You don't technically have to build this client from scratch. Actually, YouTube does offer one for you. Um, for me though, um, I, I kind of like certain things being able to have just a little bit more control over certain things. And, uh, sometimes there's little things here and there that, you know, for whatever reason, I'm just OCD about, and I'm like, no, I want to do it like that or something like that. The big thing that's going to be really important is our authentication. That was really the only reason I even started going down this client path was because the authentication process, you do have to. There's a couple of little tricks that you can do where you can save the state and then you can use that every time you log on. And so that way you don't have to constantly go to the redirect URL, authorize it to run your script. Um, that becomes very tedious very quickly. And then additionally, just making things a little bit more apparent and then having certain things that are just easier to do. So for example, being able to grab all the playlists that belong to a particular channel um, I kind of built in that functionality, so that wasn't necessarily there, but that's very useful. And then also things like, you know, just saving the data. So I'm very big about saving that data and that way I can use it later. So I've kind of built in functionality that will automatically do that for you. So again, there were some things that I kind of wanted to extend beyond just the regular client to kind of make it more customizable towards actually managing my channel. So. That's why you might see me do a little things a little bit differently. You might be saying, why are you going down this path if there's clearly, you know, a client out there? You know, that's just kind of a personal preference. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing saying you can't use it, but I mean, I will make this code available. So, you know, if you want to use it by all means, go right ahead. All right. So first things first, we do need to go into Google Cloud Council. All right. So um, you can go into Google or whoever you want to go to do your wonderful search. Just type in Google Cloud Council. And then usually the first result right here should be the one that you wanna use. So you just click that. And if this is the first time you've ever logged in here, you will need to sign in. Um, you might even need to create a, an account, but usually Google makes that very easy. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. I'll do my best to kind of have some links 
down below just in case people get lost. But for the most part, I think creating your account should be pretty straightforward. Now creating the project and everything, that's a little bit different. Um, from here, when you do log in, this is gonna be your dashboard. So this is basically where you just get a high level overview of things like how many APIs you've used, um, and then quick access to things like billing, error reporting, just the overall status of the platform. Just again, high level overview, and then kind of a quick access to different points that you might need to go. Now from here, I'm gonna assume that you don't have a project, right? So if you have a project, by all means, go and use it. However, if you do not have a project, you're gonna to need to create a new project. You can think of your project as kind of like an application, if you wanna think of it like that. And what you're gonna be doing is you're saying, hey, this application needs to use certain API services from Google, because we all know Google has many APIs. I mean, there's Google Maps, there's just a whole ton of different APIs that you technically can access from Google. And the way you access that is you specify a project, and then with that project, you can then access those particular API services. The reason you have to create a project is naturally a lot of these APIs, some of them are free or some of them have a free tier. And so this is Google's way of tracking what APIs you're using and then also things like, hey, how many API calls have you made today? Because for example, the YouTube API, you cannot just make calls all day long. There is actually a level, once you reach it, you have to wait until it resets. And so basically, I think it's like 10,000. Um, it's weird. They have like a resource point way of measuring it. It's, it's weird. It's not just a call. Like the call can represent, you know, 50 points because you're doing a certain operation that would be considered more data heavy than saying maybe like a get request. So like, for example, if I was going to upload a video, that's a very expensive call because I have to upload a bunch of data. And so Google doesn't treat that as just a single API call. They would consider it that because of the, the actual operation that you're doing, they, they consider that more heavily weighted. And that'll kind of make more sense once you see the, the background of it. But from here, to create a new project, you're gonna go right up here to your dropdown. Um, I already have some made, so I'm gonna see the one that I'm currently on. But if I click it, you're gonna see that these are all the projects that I have currently available. So I have this one that I was practicing for the tutorial, and then this is my main one that I currently use to manage my channel. Now from here, you're gonna to wanna to do a new project. And then with that new project, you need to make sure you give it a name, try to give it something meaningful or else it's kind of you know pointless. It's gonna be really hard to identify it. And then you also wanna make sure that you understand you actually have a quota for the number of projects that you can access. Now, this is where things can kind of get a little bit odd. So I haven't technically tried this. I don't know if it would work. Um, you might, if you were just say, for example, running into the API threshold, you might be able to create a new project and you could just swap out API keys. Not gonna tell you to do it, but try it out, see what happens. So let's give our project a name. Um, we'll call this channel management. Okay. Uh, and so nothing crazy. They're just letting you know. Um, once you do create your project ID, you can't change it later. So just keep that in mind. Once you got to stick it, once you, you know, decide what you're going to do. So you're going to create a new project. It does take a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of backend stuff that they're going to be doing. It's not super long, but you just, you know, you have to wait a little bit. Okay, perfect. So it looks like it was created so I can click it. And then you'll notice up here that now my dropdown has changed. So now I'm on my channel management, which is where I want to be. And then from here, you now need to basically specify what type of services do you plan to use with this project. Now from here, you can technically see it down here. I find that it's a little bit easier to navigate to certain places from here. So if you click the little hamburger menu icon, you can access different you know, uh, important aspects of it from here. Now, what you're concerned with is the API and services, and then you're gonna go down to dashboard. And then from here, this is again, a high level overview. So this is not any API specifically, but you can see down below, these are all the APIs that you currently, I believe these are ones you actually have access to right from the get go. However, um, these are not all the APIs that are currently available. So if you want to see all the APIs that you have access to, you want to go up to the top. So right around here of API services, and then do enable APIs and services. 
And then you're at the API library. And so this is where you can see all of Google's APIs. And this is where I was saying before, there's just a ton. <laughs> so for example, if you look at public APIs, there's 282. There are a tremendous amount of APIs and they do a wide range of things all the way from text rec recognition to speech recognition to mapping. I mean, it's just insane how many APIs that Google has available, it really is. However, we are concerned with YouTube. And so if you scroll down a little bit, you will see uh, a group here. If you don't see it, you can also see it from the side menu and you'll notice YouTube right here. Now, YouTube does offer different APIs. Some are analytics, so this is more for analytics data. So if you actually have a channel that you wanna pull analytics data, this is way so you can do it. They have a reporting API, which is basically a way where you can schedule reporting rep things ranging from a whole different things, but um, it's basically kind of integrated naturally with the analytics because if you're reporting, more than likely you're reporting on your analytics, right? And then there's the data API. The data API is where you can pull and modify, delete, and do all sorts of operations with the actual data that exists with a particular YouTube channel. Now, the thing is you have to have access to that YouTube channel. So naturally, you couldn't go to my channel, for example, and start trying to delete my data. They're not gonna let you. you. I have to give you permission to do that naturally. That's, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so with the data API, you can pull data. So say, for example, I have publicly available data. There's nothing stopping you from pulling my data, but I have to make that data publicly available. So things like tags, technically you can pull my tags. You can pull titles, you can pull descriptions. Um, I don't know if you can pull com. I think you can pull comments, but for example, you can't go to my video and say, Hey, I want to go and edit Alex's description. I don't, I don't like it. Right. You can't do that. I have to give you permission. You have to have right permission basically to my channel. So you want the YouTube data API. So you just click that and then it's going to take you to your next page. And then there's a couple different options. There's a try this API and then there's enable, um, try this. will just take you to a new link where you can do the API Explorer. And so this is where it will actually take you to the documentation for the data API. And it's basically just going high level over the different resources that are available. So comments, comment threads, members, playlists, playlist items, lots of good stuff, right? However, we wanna enable this API because technically right now it's not enabled. So you just click enable. And it's working. So really sad story today. Well, actually I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know why I'm sharing this. I got a new screen protector for my iPhone. I put it on upside down. Yeah, felt like an idiot. <laughs> so now I'm gonna have to get a new one. Oh joy. All right, so it looks like the API has now been enabled. So that's awesome. Let's go through and start creating some credentials. So there's different kinds of credentials that you're gonna be needing. One is an API key. So this is gonna be one that you're gonna be sending along with your request. And then we're gonna also need to create um, client secrets. And so this will be important when it comes to getting things like access and refresh tokens. And additionally, that's very important where it comes to actually modifying your content. So for example, if you do not have this content, guess what? You can't use it. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna create the credentials and then I'll show you how to uh, put them in your config file. And then once the video is done, I will be deleting them because naturally if you have these credentials, you could potentially use them, right? All fun. So if you notice right here, there is a create, create credentials. So you just wanna click that. And then from here, um, it's just gonna ask you a few different questions. And you just wanna say what API you're using. I'm saying I'm gonna need data API. And then it's gonna say, where will you be calling the API from? And this is one where I think for now, just do other. Um, this is one where don't do web. Uh, it's actually gonna change a little bit on how you would make a request. Um, with this one, you actually want to do an other and very important that you specify that because if you don't, when it comes to authenticating your session, you're actually going to, your redirect URI is not going to be right. And that's just important. And then you need to specify what type of data will you be accessing? So there's public and there's user data. So because I'm assuming that you're going to want to manage your own channel, you're going to have to specify user data. Now, like I mentioned before, there's some data where technically it's public data, so things like comments, things like the video description, 
So you can grab that data, but you can't edit that data, right? So you can't just go in there and start grabbing it. And then like user specific data, like you can't grab my account info, right? They're not gonna let you do that. So here I'm gonna say, I want my user data. And then here it's just gonna say, oh, do you wanna set up a consent screen? And just say, for right now, just say no. And then you need to give your OAuth 2.0 client ID a name. So just call it channel OAuth client. I mean, you can name it whatever you want. Nobody cares. Not, uh, and then, um, actually, no, I think you do have to do the API consent screen. I can't remember. <clears throat> um, Click credentials for a second, because one of these is I gonna have to get it. And then, okay, yeah, so do that. So click credentials, and then from here, you're gonna go up to create credentials, and you're gonna create two different ones. One is an API key. <clears throat> and so this is gonna be the API key that is associated with your account. Naturally, what they're gonna ask you to do is to restrict your key. When you restrict your key, what that means is it will make it where you can only use this API with certain APIs. And so that's actually really useful. You probably should do that just in case something happens. Um, you don't want them necessarily having access to every single service you were subscribed to. So what I'm saying is, hey, this API key can only be used with the YouTube data API. And then you can also give your API key a name. So you can call it YouTube client API key, you know, whatever you want. And then you can also regenerate your key. So if at any point it did get compromised or something like that, you can always regenerate a new one or you can delete your key like I'm gonna be doing. So once you have that, you should have a nice little green check, which is awesome. And then from here, you're gonna go back up and then you're gonna say OAuth client ID. And then, oh, maybe I do have to do this one. I can't remember if I did this one, um, internal. Only available to users within your organization. That's for you. Yeah, so this one you have to make it external because I think this one you have to be a G Suite user. And if you're not, they're not gonna allow you to do that, unfortunately. And then, you know, just all that kind of fun stuff. And then I think if you go back, I think you might be able to specify a client ID. No, okay. external and then just call it Sigma channel management and then save. And then it's gonna tell you about how you're not verified. Technically, if you want to make your application public, you do have to be verified. Um, because I use mine for personal use, I don't care. <laughs> However, you can also notice here that they do tell you a rate limit of 10,000 grants per day. So that is a threshold that you will hit. So just keep in mind that it is a way of um, limiting your access. Now, hopefully, I think, okay, perfect. So once you go here, you're going to say create OAuth client ID. So I'll just go back just to be clear. Create credentials down to OAuth client ID, and then you're gonna do other, and then just call it, you know, other client ID, something you can remember, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so then it's gonna generate a client ID, and then it's gonna generate a client secret. So from here, press okay, and then I'm gonna ask that you download this particular client secret. So you have your API key and then you have your client secret. If you download this, it's gonna create a JSON file. So we will grab this. Um, what I'm gonna ask you to do is if you do clone this repo, then I want you to put it into your configs file. And so you can just call it whatever you want, call it Google API credentials. It doesn't really matter. You just have to be consistent with your naming. And so, uh, We'll just call this Google API credentials sample, right? 
and then also copy your API key. If you go to this little icon right here and click that, it will copy it to your clipboard, which is what you want. And then we're gonna jump back into Visual Studio Code. Perfect. Okay, so from here, I'm now gonna show you how to write a config file. Now, technically you don't have to do this. This is optional. You could just hard code the values into your script, but you just wanna make sure that if you're doing that, that if you do decide to share your script, that you're sharing it with somebody that you trust, because naturally this is gonna have certain account information with it. And then especially if you've associated a credit card with this particular account, you wanna make sure that you keep this locked down because then people could potentially make API calls. And then if they make so much, they would actually be charging your account. So you just wanna keep that in mind. So what I would say is if you want, you can go into your configs, uh, configs folder, and then you just do a new file. And then you can do write config.py. Now I already have it there, so it's gonna say there's an issue, but just create a new Python file. So I already have one made for us. It's called write config tutorial. So with this one, this is actually gonna create a config file for us. It's a config.ini file. And then how we do that is we use the config parser module. And then what I do is I say, okay, from that module, I want you to import the config parser class. And then what we do is we initialize a new instance of that class. And then with it, we can add sections to our config file. And those sections do different things, right? So they could do things like, you know, hey, this is my section for my database. This is my section for my API services just different things. But the important thing is, is it makes it structured and you can kind of, I would say, aggregate certain things where it's nicely organized. And so from here, I've already kind of laid out everything. So you are more than welcome to just copy this information. You're going to have to change certain things like things like file paths, <laughs> obviously. Um, but I would say it's just create a section, call it main. And then inside your main section, you can set certain variables. And so in this case, I have an API key. Well, I'm just gonna paste in the API key that I copied from the console. And then I have things like a channel ID because naturally I'm gonna be working with my channel a lot. And so this is just the channel that if you went into my URL right now, you would see it in there. So this is just an easy way for me to identify my channel. And then I have certain playlists that I have things all organized in. So there's kind of this master playlist that has every video I've ever uploaded. So if I want the kind of master playlist that will give me everybody, this is the playlist that I use. So this is important for me when it comes to downloading my content. Everybody who creates a YouTube channel, you're gonna have a master playlist. You always have it, it's always your first playlist. Identifying it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, normally what, I'm trying to remember, I think it's if you do a, if you pull just every playlist, I think you would be able to see it. I, I'll have to double check. I have to remember how I got it. And then you're gonna have to specify a client secret path. And then this other thing called a state path, I'll explain what that is in a second. The client secret path, well, that's just what we pulled from over here, right? So that was just that Google API credentials sample.json file. So actually, if you open this up and I like to format it, You'll notice right here that it's pretty straightforward. Um, they have a client ID, they have a project ID, they have an auth URI, token URI, and just some other information. So this is auto-generated by Google, but we'll find that we can use this, basically your credentials file, to authenticate a session. So this is important when it comes to authenticating the session so that way you can edit and modify data that belongs to your channel. So it's very important that you have this file Again, you wanna make sure that you keep this secure because it does have important information. So like I'm saying is I have it here, but I'm also planning to delete it after the video, but naturally you would wanna keep it you know, secret. Okay, so you wanna have another variable called client secret path, and it's gonna to point to that JSON file. Now I need to change mine a little bit because I still have the old one. I'm gonna do sample, okay? And then from here, there's gonna be something called a state path. The state path is basically kind of similar to what I've done in previous series. So like interactive brokers, TD Ameritrade, and those different APIs, what I did is I created a session state file. So this is a way where if your access token expires, there's a now an easy way for it to automatically refresh. 
So this way it saves that information there. And then what it will do is it will use the information in that file to then go and reauthenticate your session. So it's very useful sometimes. Again, there can be sensitive information inside of it. So you just wanna make sure that you keep it in a secure spot. Now, in this one, by default, you're not gonna have one the first time you use this library. So all you really are gonna be defining here is the location of it. I like to keep everything in the same spot. So I'm just gonna put it in my configs folder. And then you just wanna give it a name. I like to call it YouTube underscore state. Uh, I, I have a common naming convention. So anything that has state in it, I know, okay, that's the important one. And then here, I'm just gonna make it consistent with my credentials one and just call it sample. So this is all very important information. This is just making sure that things flow nicely, if that's how you wanna put it. And then once you've basically defined your section and each item in that section, you wanna write that information to a config file. So what I do here is I say with open, so I'm gonna open a file. That file is gonna be located in my configs folder and it's gonna be called config.ini. Now I already have one there, so I don't wanna overwrite that one because it has my information in it. So I'm gonna call this one sample, config underscore sample. Now in your situation, you're not gonna have one there. So you can just leave it config and don't have to worry about the sample. And then I do my mode as write plus. So write plus basically means if the file doesn't exist, well, create it and then write to it. Um, if it does exist, great, overwrite it. And then I specify my alias and then I'm gonna say config.write file. So I'm saying take my config parser, call the write method, pass through my file object. So if I run this, perfect. I'm now gonna have my config underscore sample file. If I go into it, you'll notice I have all my information that I need and it's nicely organized. So now that we've done that, we have our config file, we have um, all the important stuff to now start creating a session. So I'm gonna cut off the video here and the next video, what we're gonna start doing is we're gonna start coding our client object. And with our client object, we're gonna handle kind of the, the important, but not necessarily the exciting stuff, the authentication aspect of it from the get-go. And we're gonna see about different libraries that we're gonna have to have installed so that way we can make sure everything works. So thank you again for watching this video. If you have any questions, by all means, ask away. Otherwise, we will see you in the next video.